Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime. From the Apostrophe Podcast Network. Hello, everybody. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. And now we come to the finale, part three of my one-sided Bigfoot conversation beside the raging Rogue River in Southern Oregon. I could do many more hours of these filling in the holes and pulling apart the threads of dozens of points of discussion on the matter of the phenomenon known as Bigfoot. And don't forget, I produced a 10-part documentary series called Survivor Man Bigfoot. You can see it right now on my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Dash Les Stroud. Go check it out. And yes, please subscribe to the channel. That's important. It's free and I'll keep them coming. Check out the playlists to find Bigfoot. To every point I make, I'm sure there's a counterpoint. If you're still listening to these all the way through, then obviously you find it all endearing and interesting. And why not? The subject has captured the imagination of the public for many years, and due to TV and social media, it's now at an all-time high. So let's return to part three, and the final words from my one-sided conversation while sitting beside the wild and scenic Rogue River. Because subtleties are not things you can use as proof when you tell your mom. But yet subtleties, you feel, you experience them. And and when you're involved with subtle breaks in trees or subtle things you hear or feel, you know they're very, very real. But the minute you're speaking them out of your mouth and the words are coming out of your mouth, you're realizing... This isn't like I have a picture. This isn't like I have a body in my arms. These are all subtle experiences that I had, but they all add up together. They all make a picture that you can look at intellectually and go, come on, man. I never realized you were so insecure Using all your childish lies to get me over here I know that there is only one thing that you crave you want it in your hands to touch it and to play. I proceeded to walk out of the forest by myself in the dark. I hadn't even heard about mind speak and all that stuff yet. I didn't, not, I, I was still looking for an ape. And uh, walk along the trail, and all of a sudden, the hair goes up on the back of my neck. And I thought, I'm going to confront this feeling. Maybe there's a cougar. Maybe it's a black bear, maybe it's a wolf, maybe it's my animal instinct speaking. So I just stay and go, okay. It's dark at this point. Let's see what's here. And then inside here, right in the middle, right in there, stronger than ever, was a voice that was not my own. And it simply said, Don't lay your greasy fingers on its tall and straightened length. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Have strength. Hearing sounds in the bush is a a tough one to nail down. I've heard the screams. Could have been cougar. Could have been porcupines mating. There'd be screaming going on for that, for sure. I don't know. Could have been a satanic ritual with some crazy women out in the forest. I don't know. But I've heard the screaming. I can't account for it. The howling. I've heard the ape-like grunting that I heard in Alaska, where there are no apes. I'm really grateful that there are people who are focused on the the audio of the experience of researching Sasquatch, but it's just one piece of the puzzle because your ears will trick you, echoes will trick you, valleys will trick you. And right now I can hear constantly the sound of a river that's down at the bottom of this valley. I don't know how many sounds that's muffling while I sit here. So what I value about Ron Moorhead is authenticity. Some of these people like Ron, they're not into it, in it to be stars or TV stars. I never got into teaching survival to be a TV star guru. I just want to teach the skills. I didn't get into the Bigfoot thing 
to be a Bigfoot guru. I just really love the phenomenon. And I think Ron Moorhead is the same. Todd Standing is the same. I can name a lot of names. Cliff from Founding Bigfoot. He really, you know, he really believes in this, in all of this uh, research. And they're all genuine people. And those are the people you want to look for. Those who are not trying to be TV stars because of Bigfoot. Anything that I would have to say about the Patterson-Gimlin footage, Patty, as, she, as it's been nicknamed because it's a female, not a lot of the general public know that, it's a female. There are breasts. Well, so we think it's a female because of the breasts. It's just so much speculation because it's just a bunch of grainy footage. I don't know. We can get stuck in a positive echo chamber here. I want to believe. I want to think that that, when I say believe this time, I mean believe the story of, of Bob Gimlin and, and Patterson. But for every expert that says there's no way that footage could have been faked, we'll find another expert that says it absolutely was fake. What I don't get sucked into are the people who say, that was me in the suit. I was my uncle in the suit. That's the stuff I just was like, oh, go away. Just go away. Grow up. The thing about what you experience when you're out there, especially if you happen to be researching Sasquatch, is becoming very, very aware of the subtleties. This is a problem because subtleties are not things you can use as proof when you tell your mom. But yet subtleties, you feel, you experience them. And when you're involved with subtle breaks in trees or subtle things you hear or feel, you know they're very, very real. But the minute you're speaking them out of your mouth and the words are coming out of your mouth, you're realizing this isn't like I have a picture. This isn't like I have a body in my arms. These are all subtle experiences that I had, but they all add up together. They all make a picture that you can look at intellectually and go, come on, man. So I'll give you an example. For me, it's the subtle action or whatever you want to call it of a tree being pushed over or falling over. Do trees fall over on their own? Absolutely. The, the big one was in uh, Clem 2 and still night, no wind, the water's like glass, not a breath of air. And all of a sudden a big tree doesn't like boom, it's like boom. And the hair's up on the back of my neck. Now the thing is, this is an, um, an attribute or it's a, a thing that people have talked about for years. Oh, they push trees over. Maybe they're doing it just to get a rise out of you, see what you're gonna do. Maybe they're doing it to scare you off or warn you. I don't know. But to date, I've probably had somewhere between 12 and 15 trees pushed over, always about 100 feet away from me, always on a dead still night with zero wind. And I can't explain that. Maybe it's just highly coincidental because I do spend a lot of time in the woods. I just happen to be around a lot of trees that are falling down that happen to rot and fall at that exact moment that I happen to be there. But that's subtle in many ways. What's, oh, come on, last. They're just trees falls, trees fall in the forest all the time. I know, I know, I know. But you gotta understand, when I'm there, it happens. To me, there's a whole other experience that's going on. And I really don't forget that. I never forget that because I pay attention to it. Well, now you're just noticing it, what you wanna notice. No, it wasn't happening before, but it sure happens now. There's another element to all of this that people love to talk about. When you research Bigfoot, and I mean really go out there and get involved, do they sense this? Do they sense and know through psychic ability, let's say, that you're a, you're a friendly? Well, a lot of people will say yes, and your experiences start to grow exponentially. It definitely happened to me. I went from poking the hornet's nest to being right in the middle of it with a swarm of activities and things going on all around me. And now that I'm not, and although I'm out in the bush just as much, but everything's dying down, because I'm not trying, not looking, not, you know, so not so much happens. Every once in a while, if I pay attention and I try something, it just picks right up again. So is there a relationship between, say, me and them, psychically, because they are a species that understands us a little bit more than we do? I don't know, could be crazy talk, or it could be something. When I started filming Survive Man Bigfoot, I walked through the steps, thinking of it as a big ape. So I was doing trail cams, and I was using scent packages, and trip wires, and all the dusting places for tracks and prints, and all that sort of stuff. That part is, I th that's the fun part. I think a lot of it is 
futile because, again, it's like putting a beach ball in the middle of your kitchen table. They know what you're doing, I think, in many ways. That's why they can avoid it all. But it's kind of fun to do it. Here's the thing about anecdotal references. Here's the thing about when people tell you they had an experience. I love doing this. I did this at a keynote one time. Here's something I absolutely love to do for people when they have friends and associates that say they had an experience. This happened to me. Oh, my uncle always told me. So I had a guy said uh, uh, once, he, he said, oh yeah, man, my, you know, my aunt, she, um, she saw them twice, 10 feet away. And she's a smart cookie, you know, she's a PhD, smart lady, and she likes the wilderness. This just happened. Invariably, you get next. You know, but I don't know. I don't know. And that's when I like to pounce. Whoa, whoa, stop for a second. You don't know. Okay. Let's call your aunt. Oh, I want to call her up, and I want you to say, you're a liar. Well, that's my aunt. Well, I know, but... but you just said how much you respect her and she's intelligent and she wasn't high and she wasn't a drinker and she was all this stuff. And now you say, but I don't know if they're real. Well, then she must be lying, don't you think? If she said she saw one 10 feet away, she must be lying. Well, here's the deal. There's only four things that, that can happen here. Mistaken identity. You can rule that out when you're talking to a conservation officer. Delusion. Delusion is a cop-out. You can't answer that one. There's no argument back for what people go, you're delusional. All right, yes, we're all delusional. You have to let that one go. So we'll put delusional over on the table for a second. They're lying, right? So mistaken identity, delusional. Lying, or they're giving you an accurate representation of what they saw. And if that is the case, then guess what? They're real. And this is what I like to do when you get somebody telling you a great story about a Bigfoot encounter and it's a conservation officer, a highly respected smart man and there's no drugs involved or alcohol or anything, you got to bring it down to those, those three things. They either made a mistaken identity, they were lying right to your face, or they were telling the truth. In the instance of interviewing people who've seen Sasquatch, it's like the six o'clock news. Get the crazy person on camera. It, it rates better. And so we get inundated with the crazy people. Oh, yeah, my grandpa had them come in his living room and he fed them bacon 20 odd years and I never got used to that. But we go over on Sunday and that's that's the inter that's the stuff you have to sit through that is it's just ridiculous when in fact the majority are intelligent, normal people minding their own business who did not want to see Bigfoot and they were jogging or they were a doctor. They were, I don't know, think of any respectable human being, no matter what job they did. They didn't want to see Bigfoot. Most of the people that I've ever spoken to, they don't want any money for it. They don't want to be known for it. They just, and if you talk, you sit there and look at them. They'll just go, look, I know what happened. I know what happened to me that night on the mountain, and I still can't explain it. So if you want to say, ah, less, well, you can say that, but I know what happened. So there's a lot more of intelligent, respectable people that have these experiences than the crazies. It wasn't easy deciding which songs to play along with these podcasts about Bigfoot. But to keep the spirit light, I thought this next song fit the bill. From my debut album of the year 1999, yes, that would be from the last century when the thought of a pandemic was only in the minds of Hollywood writers, this is a song I recorded for a dear friend of mine who is no longer with us. This is my cover of Randy Clark's song, Don't Touch It. Hey, what are you doing over there? I never realized you were so insecure Using all your childish lies to get me over here And I know that there is only one thing that you crave You want it in your hands to touch it and to play but don't touch it, oh no, it's much too big for you. Don't touch it, though it's long and sleek, it's true. Don't lay your nasty hands upon its tall and glistening shine. Don't touch it, don't touch it, it's mine. Well, I never realized you were so immature. Still you won't change my mind I'd like to keep it pure 
And though you thought you'd worship it And keep it for yourself Girl, I've only fingered it Once or twice myself So don't touch it Oh, it's much too big for you Don't touch it Though it's long and sleek, it's true Don't lay your greasy fingers on its tall and straightened length Don't touch it, don't touch it, have strength Well, she talked her sweet talk And I'm telling you no lie She grabbed it right in front of me And let her fingers fly By the time she was a finished There was a spinning round my head I felt I must apologize So I turned to her and I said Well, I've never realized That you do that so well I wasn't gonna let you touch <laughs> Ah, but what the hell I hope you have forgiven me Cause talented you are It's just that all musicians hate To lend a new guitar So don't touch it Stop playing with that thing Don't touch it Cause you could break the string Don't you scratch the finish Stop messing with the hole Don't touch it Don't touch it You been told Maybe Ray Barnett or something like that Come on Hey, get your hands off my CDs too You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I think the funny part about going out into the field and trying to have an interaction with a Bigfoot is we all start doing things that we think are imitating them, which just comes down to hunting. It's like, you know, hunters will take moose antlers and clack them together to imitate bullfighting to bring in another bull to hunt. We're doing it with this Bigfoot thing too. So apparently there's a lot of circumstances where they purportedly bang on trees with big clubs. I'll tell you an interesting theory on that. Unless they're carrying the clubs around with them, you don't just always find the perfect baseball bat to make that perfect sound on the tree. And Todd Stanning actually had a real interesting thought. Think of the size of their heads. Huge. The air cavity they could do with their muff. So what if they were just doing that? Big thing doing it. On the other side of a valley and it echoes. Did you hear that? Sounds like they hit the tree with a, a club, a stick. It's just, that could be really loud in the right circumstances. So what it is, I don't know, but we bang on trees. Breaking over branches. This one was always plausible to me right away because I had studied how Aboriginal cultures in Canada communicated to each other on the trail by breaking over branches, by putting little twigs in the ground in a formation. All of those things was a message to the next person that was coming along. We were here, we did this, we're going there, we'll meet you back at the village. So could an intelligent species like Bigfoot be communicating through bending branches? Sure, that's not even a stretch as far as I'm concerned. We put down scent spray and dust, anything to get a footprint, to see if you could get a definitive print. It's kind of silly, classic stuff, like you're some kind of detective, and oh, we'll catch him when the burglars come in next time. You start doing stuff like that, but you're out in the woods. It's so vast. It's really kind of silly when you think about it. So when I started thinking it was silly, I thought, well, what should I be doing? And that opened up the world of telepathic communication, psychic ability, which I'm, in a fanciful way, that interests me. I think it's pretty cool. What if communicating telepathically for a Sasquatch was the same as breathing is to you and I, or speaking is to you and I? Well, that's just what they would do. So, I mean, I had my experiences that I can't explain. Enough in one situation where I went in and asked a doctor if I was schizophrenic, and it's only happened four times out in the woods, and I'll tell you, and they call it mind speak, when you all of a sudden, and there it is, and it's talking to you, and it's under these circumstances, freak the hell out of me. So if you're going to research, and you research with an open mind, well, heck, you could just go sit in the woods and meditate, 
and hope for an encounter. That might be all you need to do. Never mind trail cams and scent powder and trip wires. Never mind all that effortful stuff that seems to be a joke. And that would be the future for me. I just go out now and remain incredibly open to an encounter. So I'll give a tip here. Let's say you're open to this. Let's say you're open to psychic ability. Let's assume they have this. Okay. Well, the next time you go out hiking, just put it out there. I'm out here. I'd be really interested in experiencing a meeting with you. Just going to hike this trail for the day. If you're out there, I'd be down with that. And see what happens. I've done that. And then had some very strange experiences, so I was not high. I mean, I've told it before publicly, so it's not that big of a deal. It's really the first one that's the most vital. I've had them since, but I can't communicate telepathically. I'm not psychic. I don't know any of that stuff. But there I was in Tennessee, Smoky Mountains, with uh, Scott Carpenter, shooting Survivor Man Bigfoot, researching all of his hotspots. I stayed out by a tree. I waited for it to get dark. Of course, it was stormy and windy. It was spooky. Sense got away before it got dark. And then I proceeded to walk out of the forest by myself in the dark. I hadn't even heard about mind speak and all that stuff yet. I didn't, not, I, I was still looking for an ape. And uh, walk along the trail, and all of a sudden, the hair goes up on the back of my neck. And I thought, I'm gonna confront this feeling. Maybe there's a cougar. Maybe it's a black bear. Maybe it's a wolf. Maybe it's my animal instinct speaking. So I just stay and go, okay. It's dark at this point. Let's see what's here. And then inside here, right in the middle, right in there, stronger than ever, was a voice that was not my own. And it simply said, we're right over here on this hill. If you want to meet us, stay the night. Now I think I'm crazy. And bear in mind, I'm supposedly Survivor Man. I should be all cool out in the bush. I actually stood there and like, oh my, what the heck was that? In the words of Will Smith and many characters, hell no. And I stood there and I thought, I got an answer. This is me. I'm, I, I didn't even have a glass of wine that night. I was just out in the wilderness where I'd been a thousand plus times. And I thought, and I wasn't ready. And I, I literally said, with my mind, I said, I, I'm not ready for this. No, I, I can't. And I'm thinking like, oh, you know, Scott's waiting for me in the parking lot. I really, I'm trying to think like, I'm making excuses now in my head to this voice. It was really freaky. I said that. I said, I'm, I'm not ready for this. Because I wasn't. And then in my head, this thick, no, feelings aren't facts. But it felt for all the life of me like it was a very large in his prime male and a smaller one. It's just like that image was burned into my brain and that, that voice. And they were right over there on that hill. When I said, I'm not ready, they responded with, all right, switch yourself. And they turned and walked away. The hair went down in the back of my neck. All the scary feelings were gone. And I had just instant regret, like I just missed an amazing opportunity. But I was, first time in my life, I was nervous. So that, what is that? I went in and saw a, a counselor and said, I told, I said, am I, am I schizophrenic? Because first of all, if you were schizophrenic, you wouldn't be asking if you were schizophrenic. So that was like, whew. And I mean, the counselor even said, you just, you received a gift. And I've had that happen three other times since then. And that's within a span of 10 years. I've had it three other times, so. In 10 years, four times, hundreds of hikes. So, and somebody asked me recently about communicating telepathically. I said, just do that. Just go out in the woods and open it up. I'll do that now on every hike. I won't even tell my wife. I'm just like, we're hiking like it. And I try to use that thing, like, am I sensing anybody out here? Well, if you're out here, I come in love. I, I, I'd love to see you. Never seen you. Speak to him with respect. Give him that much or commitment. I think that Bigfoot, this phenomenon, has created an incredible opportunity to be in love with the wilderness again, to be in love with the forest, to get out in nature. You know, I, I was, the last time I was on Joe Rogan, it was really late at night and we had been partying. So I could not put one sentence in front of the other. But Joe had me on the spot at one moment because I, I went to say, 
Well, in the end, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to just write it off because it's a pretty magical. And he was magical, ah, magical, fluffy, woo, woo. But it is. It is a pretty emotional and profound experience to be out searching for anything in these beautiful woods. I'm a big believer that nature heals and, and intensely so. It just it does wonderful healing. So if Bigfoot gets people back out in the wilderness, I'm all for it. Real or not, real or not, it's a great place to be. The irony of my frustration with what Finding Bigfoot did to the phenomenon is somewhat dampened or, or, or softened, I should say, with this cultural acceptance of it. Bigfoot pop, Bigfoot this, Bigfoot come to the Bigfoot bar, do shots, you know, whatever. I'm all for it. Why not? They either are real or they aren't. And if they aren't real, then who cares? It's just a fun cultural thing. You know, no different from, ha, huh, the Avengers. <laughs> it's just a thing. It's just a fantasy thing. I'm, you know, I'm all for it. Again, if anything that leads people to think I, I should go hike a trail, then I'm really all for it. Even if it turns out to be, have all been fanciful nonsense all along. I think I'm a pretty good judge of people and I tend to smell a hoaxer out pretty quickly and walk away. If Todd Standing hoaxed me, more power to him. I don't think he did. If he did, he's one of the few people that were able to. The hoaxing thing is unfortunate. That's why I look a lot to the older anecdotal references and stories, because hoaxing now is widespread. College boys are all about it. But before, it, it just wasn't there. But here's the thing. If you go up to a remote lake in northern Ontario to go fishing, and the float plane drops you down, and you get out on the beach, and you see a quarter mile long bunch of footprints that are 18 inch human-like footprints walking bipedal. That wasn't a hoaxer. You have to actually judge the hoaxing. If you go to a park outside of LA, yeah, <laughs> there's a good chance it's just college boys having fun. You go somewhere in the middle of the Northwest Territories or the Northwest Pacific Coast, Washington, you're way out there and you see something incredible. Well, you know, there aren't college boys waiting out in the middle of nowhere to hoax you. They're waiting in national parks close to the campground, but they're not waiting a two-day walk out on a rough trail just so they could jump out and go boo. So you gotta judge the hoax. You gotta look at it and say, hang on a second, who is that bored? with their lives that they're gonna, uh, that's why a lot of times I'll see footage on YouTube and I'll look at it and go, come on, you really think this, I'll be really gentle here, non-athletic family camping in this place and this whole thing, you really think that they went to that much trouble to try to get somebody in a suit to be that far away to do, you know, like after a while, I was like, come on, man, people hoax, but they, we're path of least resistance, we're gonna hoax if it's easy. Not too many people are gonna hoax if it's hard. If you start going down the rabbit hole of, is there a cover-up? Is there a conspiratory cover-up of all of these things going on? And, and so these government officials come out later on in life with nothing to lose and say, I'm telling you, I know what we saw. Then you have to start to ask the question, why? What's the plausibility of a cover-up? Why do they care? I mean, there's elephants and whales and tigers and Sasquatch. Why does the government care to cover something like that up? Well, A, if they're not just big apes, but they're intelligent, and B, they live in these remote places, who stands to lose an awful lot of lumber and mining money if they are proven definitively to exist in these valleys and forests? All of a sudden, there's a lot of industrial claim going, whoa, 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 you're gonna let it out? that there's proof that the Sasquatch are in this valley, that valley's worth $18 billion to my company. Now we're gonna bury this. Well, how are we gonna bury? We're gonna hire a private militia to go in it. You see what I'm going with this? That's not that difficult to accept. It doesn't become difficult to accept that if somebody's gonna lose a lot of money, they don't care whether they're real or not. Some industrial billionaire who stands to lose a lot of money is gonna go, I want to hire some mercenaries. I want them to go in. How many did you say they're in there? 16? Yeah, well, I want the mercenaries to go in and wipe them out. And these are different stories you hear. So 
Why a cover-up? Because they ostensibly live in the most prime real estate on the planet. It's worth a lot of money. I can't imagine how this particular podcast, if you made it this far, would not have spurred on a hundred more questions. And not to be a tease, but I do have some more answers. Well, at least to maybe half of those questions. But that's for another time. What I really hope it spurred on was your desire to get out into the woods and maybe, just maybe, experience something beautiful and powerful for yourself and pay attention to the subtleties of it all. But before you do that, go check out my documentary series, Survivor Man Bigfoot, right now on my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Dash Les Stroud. Scan the playlists for Bigfoot. My very subtle engineer is Keith Ullman. And Surviving Life with Les Stroud is a proud member of the Apostrophe Podcast Network, who may not be beautiful and powerful, but they are extremely cool. In fact, go check out their podcasts, Under the Influence with Terry O'Reilly, and We Regret to Inform You with Terry's daughter, Sydney O'Reilly. They are a phenomenon. Stick around, everyone. We'll figure this life out together. Oh, wait, hang on. My new series, Wild Harvest, is airing now on American Public Television. Check to see which station's signal reaches your area. And that includes, by the way, Canada. It's all about local foraging. I take you out and teach you what you can gather for a wild edible feast. A feast prepared by a five-star chef, Paul Rogalski. As well, head over to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Dash Les Stroud, where I'm uploading tons of free content weekly for you to enjoy including archives, Survivor Man, Survivor Man Bigfoot, director's commentaries, and new music, just to mention a bit of what's there. The secret, by the way, is to click on the playlists. Lastly, and in time for Christmas, the second printing of my 20th anniversary film collection, featuring 76 films, is available through my website, lesstroud.ca. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. What are you waiting for? Click on subscribe and then click on something else. Or, go be productive. <laughs>